Yes. All right. Well, in that case, I'm happy to introduce uh, Ignat Sirocco, who will soon be at the University of North Texas, uh, speaking about divergence in coxeter groups. Thank you very much, Greg. It's always a pleasure and an honor to speak at this conference, this workshop in geometric topology. It becomes a good tradition for me. Uh, so I will talk about divergence in coxeter groups. And this is a joint uh, project with Paula Vidani from, from Louisiana, Yusra Nakvi, who is now in College London, University of College London, and Anne Thomas, who is at uh, University of Sydney. This project started when I visited Anne in Australia, right before COVID made it uh, sort of complicated. And it's close, it will be finished in the next two weeks. We are already polishing our uh, last version of the archive. So, divergence in Coxter groups. I will start with explaining what divergence is. That's a function which is a uh, characteristic of a geodesic metric space. So if X is our geodesic metric space and for convenience, we consider that it is one-ended, meaning if we take away large enough bounded or compact set, uh, the remaining set is connect. And we consider a sphere of radius r around some point. All our spaces will be homogeneous, so it doesn't matter which point we take. We can look at r avoidant paths. That is, we take two points on a sphere and consider all paths that uh, stay away of the ball of radius r. And out of these paths, we take a shortest one. Shortest one, or if there is no shortest path, we take in infimum of length. There are such situations when in some spaces, the shortest path may not exist, but then still infimum of length can be taken. And then all, out of all points, pair of points on the sphere, we take the maximum such value. So, in a way, uh, that's, that defines divergence as a function of radius. So, how bad uh, are, uh, it measures how points outside of ball of radius R can be connected using uh, neighborhood of infinity. So, if we are talking about groups, and I'm interested in uh, geometric group theory, then we treat group as a geometric object. So our space will be Cayley graph. Uh, and divergence of a group will be defined for its Cayley graph. Under a certain natural equivalence relation on functions, uh, this becomes independent of the choice of generating set, for example. So it's a good invariant. And if we look at very easy examples like Euclidean space, uh, R2, Euclidean plane, or hyperbolic plane, we see that divergence in Euclidean place is linear. It's just half of circumference of a circle of radius R. So as a function of R, it is a linear function. And if we draw a circle on the, on the hyperbolic plane, then as formula from Wikipedia tells us that uh, circumference uh, of a circle of radius R in hyperbolic plane is given by sinh, hyperbolic sign, which is asymptotic to exponent in R. So we see two contrasting behaviors. For Euclidean space, it's linear. For hyperbolic space, it's exponential. And the same is uh, observed in symmetric spaces of non-compact type. If it's Euclidean, the divergence is linear. If it's non-positively curved and not Euclidean, it's exponential. So this led Michael Gromov to uh, 
suggest that maybe same dichotomy should be true for more general spaces than uh, symmetric spaces, but which still exhibit some non-positively curved behavior. He uh, uh, defines such spaces in a slightly more general context, which now include cat zero spaces in modern terminology. But it's turned out that his expectation uh, turned out to be false. And uh, first it was Gersten who came up with an example of a uh, group with divergence of uh, order R square, polynomial R square. And these uh, examples are cat zero, which means the triangles are not, not uh, fatter than in Euclidean space. It's a natural generalization of hyperbolic and Euclidean space. It sort of combines properties of both. Then Natasha Makura came up with similar examples of uh, cubic divergence and later with arbitrary polynomial uh, divergence, degree divergence. And I emphasize that uh, these examples are cat zero spaces, which are which fall into the class of spaces Gromov was interested in. So we see that divergence is an interesting invariant which uh, behaves slightly defying our expectations in the class of cat zero groups. And if we step away from the class of cat zero groups, even wilder behavior uh, is observed. Very recently, Noel Brandy and uh, Han Tran from University of Oklahoma, uh, they proved that divergence, uh, there are groups which exhibit divergence uh, of order R to uh, fractional exponent, fractional, even non-rational exponent. And uh, this parameter alpha is dense in uh, interval from two to infinity. And also they came up with a similar examples where it's not even a polynomial, it's a function of type polynomial times logarithm. Yes. So that's a very interesting uh, invariant worth studying. And the natural question is, given your favorite class of groups, what spectrum of divergence functions does it have? And depending on your uh, preference or taste, we can look at different groups. And in this project, we look at Coxter groups. And this is a time to pause because I'm gonna now switch gear and speak about Coxter groups. Do we have any questions or clarifications that I may uh, speak about? I don't see chat in my mode, but please. I just wonder, uh, is there any uh, uh, relation to dimension uh, where, where this Coxter group is working? Dimension of space, like, uh, so, so far I was, uh, your uh, explanation was like for dimension two uh, explaining, uh, but really it should depend on dimension of the space where uh, the group acts. I guess the, Divergence is defined for arbitrary spaces. I don't have a limitation on uh, dimension two. It was just my example on, of the plane for dimension two. And no, the, 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 the problem is that in high dimensions, this is an uh, old result by uh, Weinberg, and, uh, Weinberg uh, based on analysis of Nikulin of complexity of uh, sides of Coxter uh, uh, polyhedra. So that's in uh, high dimensions, uh, at least say, uh, bigger than theory, there are no reflection groups at all. Yes, so there are Coxter groups and there are reflection groups. Coxter groups are a slightly bigger class than reflection groups. So some, uh, all reflection groups, well, under certain conditions are Coxter groups, but uh, there are Coxter groups which obviously cannot be uh, represented as take a polyhedron and start reflecting in its faces in some hyperbolic space, 
This is a more narrow, narrow class, which Winberg uh, proved that it cannot exist in hyperbolic space in dimensions bigger than 29, right? Yeah. Uh, for what I remember. But Coxter groups are uh, not reduced to re reflection groups. That's yes, right. of course. Yeah. And our dimension will be dimension of ambient Davis complex, which can also be arbitrary. So what are these Coxter groups? Uh, it's given by uh, a finite set of generators and a matrix of integers, positive integers from two to infinity, including the symbol of infinity. And this encodes a, a finite presentation where two generators in such a corresponding element of matrix give one. Uh, in particular, that means that uh, S, S equals one for all generators S. So they are they behave like reflections and all, actually all reflection groups fall in this class. Usually it's encoded by conveniently encoded by a Coxter graph, sometimes called Dinkin graph, where we omit commuting generators. So there is no edge if two generators commute. If two ge generators are braided like, uh, a, uh, like S T S equals T S T, then uh, this is, uh, they are uh, related by a single edge. That's what uh, a single edge means. Like if it's double edge, then it means STST equals TSTS. That's uh, what uh, essentially edges of this Coxter graph mean. So, and there are notable classes of Coxter groups, spherical Coxter groups. It's uh, the same as to say finite Coxter groups. They are classified by Coxter himself back almost 90 years ago in the terms of these graphs. And that's the whole picture up to isomorphism of irreducible Coxter groups, so which do not decompose as a direct products of others. Uh, well, there are some subtleties which I don't uh, mention here, but that's the whole picture. And people who work with uh, representations or Lie algebras, complex simple Lie algebras, uh, recognize much of it. We just know that in the world of Coxter groups, there is no uh, CN. Okay, it coincides with BN. And uh, there are two more uh, non crystallographic actually much more. There is a whole uh, infinite uh, series, non-crystallographic groups. So Coxter groups are like AD classification, like uh, classification of simple complex Lie algebras, but slightly different. And there is another interesting class, uh, affine Coxter groups. These are given by the so-called extended Dinkin diagrams. And uh, they are uh, groups generated by reflections in the faces of certain simplex in Rn, in Rn, whereas spherical co Coxter groups can be viewed as uh, groups generated by reflections in a spherical simplex. You take a sphere, you embed some simplex in it and start uh, reflecting. So if you do it in Rn, that's the list of Coxter groups we get. There is a similar, if you are curious, there is a similar uh, picture for hyperbolic space. Uh, these are groups generated by reflections in the faces of a simplex, simplex, not arbitrary polyhedron, but a simplex in HM. And this is a, a picture. Lanner was first who classified them, but that's a, a little distraction, please forgive me for that. And I go back to my uh, groups. And the first part of our results is uh, the following theorem. If uh, Coxter group, I write uh, it with fixed certain 
set of Coxter generation generators. So if it's uh, irreducible and non-affine, then the divergence of it at least quadratic, at least quadratic. And this gives us complete characterization of linear divergence. So W, the Coxter group W, has linear divergence if and only if it's a direct product of two groups. One of them, either both of them are infinite, or one is allowed to be finite, but then W2, second one, is irreducible a fine of rank at least three. So uh why this is a uh, interesting class because they can contain a free abelian group of finite index so this makes it divergence linear and all an interesting phenomenon if a Coxter group has super linear divergence, then it is at least quadratic, at least quadratic. So there is a gap between divergences of R and R square. And this is uh, a little bit reminiscent of Bain functions on groups. This is another feeling invariant, but uh, it's a two dimensional feeling invariant. And divergence is sort of one dimensional feeling invariant. We take zero dimensional sphere and minimize paths which connect the two. That's divergence. And in then function, we take uh, a one dimensional sphere and fill it with uh, two dimensional objects and minimize the count of them. Both then function and divergence exhibit this gap between linear and uh, Quadratic, at least in the class of Coxter groups. I cannot say for the whole. Okay, so let me uh, go on and speak about other uh, part of our results. So Ivan Levkovitz introduced what he called a hypergraph index for right angled Coxter groups. Right angled means that all these numbers are either two or infinity. That's what right angle means. Uh, and we generalize this index for all Coxter groups. And our results say that it's zero if and only if divergence is linear. If it's one, then Coxter group has quadratic divergence. In general, if it's finite, then divergence is bounded above by a polynomial of degree h plus one. It's our next project to make this if and only if uh, statement. We work on lowest bound right now. And if uh, hypergraph index is infinite, then divergence is exponential. And this conjecture, as I mentioned, uh, when it's finite, this happens if and only if, when divergence is polynomial of one more degree. We have proven it for certain series of non-right angled Coxter groups, and from Livkovitz's results, it uh, follows that it's true for this narrow, nice, very nice class of right angled Coxter groups. Yes. So also, we relate uh, our hypergraph index with Betty number of a defining of the Coxter graph. Essentially, Betty number is rank of uh, first homology group. Essentially, count the holes in this graph. So we say that if H is finite, then hypergraph index is uh, bounded by Betty number plus one. In particular, if the Coxter graph is a tree, which is majority of cases people are interested in Coxter groups. They work with Coxter groups. It's either a tree or there is some one cycle. So in the case when it's a tree, then divergence has either linear, quadratic, or exponential behavior. And all these possibilities are realized. Okay, I'll give you a little picture 
<coughs> of different uh, divergences. So disregard the red lines, the auxiliary. But for example, this one, uh, part A, has linear divergence, hypergraph index zero. And actually, this is uh, a fine Coxter group of type A8 tilde, its official name. Uh, but this one has hypergraph index one, hypergraph index two, and this hypergraph index infinite. So we can say that this divergence is exponential here for sure. Here, divergence is uh, quadratic, and here, divergence is bounded by a cubic polynomial. Okay, I think my time is up. So it's a natural place to stop. All right, let's thank Ignat. So um, questions, I actually have a question. So back uh, before you started talking about Coxeter groups more specifically, uh, you were talking about the general uh, results for uh, which, which polynomials could be realized as divergence. And um, I think it was Noel Brady and somebody else had proven that there, you could find uh, uh, exponentials in a dense set from two to infinity. Um, is, is anything known between one and two? No, that's the beauty of it. We expect that there is a gap. There is a gap between linear and quadratic. And as I said, this gap is already, this behavior of having gap between linear and quadratic is observed in a, a different filling function, Dain function of groups. Uh, di divergence is one dimensional filling function. Dain function is two dimensional. For Dain function, it is proven also by Brady and I think Martin Brightson uh, that there is a gap in the code. They call it isoperimetric spectrum of group. And okay. it is expected from some very, very general analogy considerations that it would be natural that divergence exhibit the same behavior. So if you look at uh, this condition, then D is at least two. So there is nothing they produced which lies between R and R square. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I would like to ask, um, where do we need the, 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 the metric space as just one end? One end? Because uh, what is one end? We take a uh, complement of bounded set, right? And if we cut it out, we must be able to connect any two points outside of it. For that, the complement should be connected. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, not a number. It's uh, infinite. We cannot connect, so distance will be infinite. Infinity is maybe an interesting uh, fact, but we want to quantify and it is not a real number. That's why we wanted one end. However, however, people were thinking how to uh, generalize divergence for non one ended spaces and there are results in this direction. I'm just not, haven't worked with that notion with that specific variant. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? 